Today on Locked On Canadians, what will Cole Caulfield's next contract look like? Also, we want to revisit the face-offs question that we talked about last week. And finally, the Canadians still need some help on D. So who is available? Pretty much nobody. We're going to see what options the Canadians might have on that route. And that's all coming up on Locked On Canadians. Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to episode 681 of Locked On Canadians. Today's episode, we are going to talk about Cole Caulfield's next contract, what it could look like. We're also going to talk about the Canadians' help on D. And finally, we're going to revisit the face-off question that had some people quite upset with us on Friday's episode. But first, let's introduce ourselves. My name is Laura Saba, also known as The Active Stick. And if you haven't seen too much of me lately, it's because Scott has been carrying the show while I've been dealing with a family visit and a uh, family wedding. And all kinds of fun stuff like that. But now I am back and I will be rambling and not allowing Scott to talk until we're a good 90 seconds into this episode. Scott, how are you doing? Oh, I have to introduce you first. Scott Matlove, Habs Eyes on the Prize. (laughs) (laughs) How are you doing on this beautiful, it is Labor Day weekend. We will be dropping this episode on Monday, but we are recording it on Sunday night. So I... Um, have recovered from my chicken winning related trauma on Friday night. Uh, I lived for everyone who was praying for my downfall. Sucks to suck. Um, <laughs> I'm doing good though. The chicken wings did not do any lasting damage except to my psyche. Uh, do not eat the last dab unless you truly, truly hate yourself. Outside of that, I'm good. We are so close. It is the 14th. We are less than two weeks away from the rookie showcase here in Buffalo. And I'm getting very excited. The prospects are slowly migrating back to Montreal. Slavkovsky and Mesha are already there. And we know more and more are going to start making that trek there shortly. So I am very ready for not meaningful, but actual hockey once again. And you can tell because I got a text from a friend this weekend uh, who was flying back through Helsinki and uh, there was a prominent NHL player uh, on his flight as well. I won't name the friend or the player. Uh, just because I'm just saying, you know, they're all on their way back to where, you know, where they play generally. It is early September. The weather is getting a little bit better. Uh, for those of you who are listening to this episode and are not on our YouTube or are not subscribed to, subscribed to our YouTube, the uh, episode in which Scott did the, the Hot Wings Challenge, the Hot Ones Challenge, sorry, is uh, listed on the YouTube. So just go to Locked On Canadians on YouTube. And you'll see where it says Locked On Canadians Extra. And there's a picture there of Scott holding the the sauces. Uh, This is way before he did it because you can tell he was smiling in the picture. He was not smiling all the way through that challenge. But uh, (laughs) it was fun. And I want to thank everybody who tuned in and asked questions and talked about it and witnessed Scott's suffering. I also want to uh, thank everybody who just, you know, listens and subscribes and follows. In the meantime... Let's talk a little bit about Face Off. So it was a mailbag question that was kind of born out of um, a radio episode that we had listened to where it was alluded to that Kirby Doc's inability to do Face Offs or his, you know, his poor stats on Face Offs was to blame for Chicago jettisoning him. I don't think that was the full picture. Obviously, that is a very narrow uh, interpretation of what was said. I do think that it was one of the things that contributed. Um, However... I think that people got really upset when, when they thought that we said that face-offs weren't important. And I just want to clarify that because it's not that face-offs are not important. It's that that's not the determining factor about whether or not you take a player or you trade for a player or you don't, uh, you know, you don't trade or draft or whatever. That's not the deciding factor because face-off, face-offs are a skill that you can work on. I mean, you can look at how, for example, I'm just going to mention Nick Suzuki. His face-off stats were not that great, right? They're still quite average. They're not amazing, right? They're still, but they're way better than they were before. You know, that's what happens when you put in the work and you put in a development program. It's a skill that you can practice and get better at. And the Canadians now have a skills coach, somebody who is going to be able to develop this in the players who aren't that great at it. And, and, And it's not to say that there aren't players who are amazing at it. It's just that, 
that's not the determining factor about whether or not a guy should be on your roster or not. Like that's what we meant. Like Michael Brand was our guest and he made, you know, a really good point about it's, it has to do with situations like offensive zone, uh, you know, uh, power play, all that, all that kind of stuff. If you're constantly losing faceoffs as a team, that's not a great sign for you. Right. But if you're a player with not great faceoff stats, you can work on it. And also you have to remember that his injury, like his, his wrist injury, right? Like that, that is a huge contributor in the way he plays. I, it's not that I don't, I should go back a little bit on this because I was a little bit harsh and say that faceoffs don't matter. It's like you said, I don't think they are as pressing a detail as people make them out to be because possession in the NHL changes so quickly. How many times have we seen someone, you know, win a faceoff back and then the shot goes wide of the net and possession changes in the grand scheme of things, faceoffs are a very small part of the game. Yes. Winning more than likely helps you in the long run. But the overall impact, I feel like, is not as exaggerated as other people make it out to be. You know, it's not like I'm trying to think of something similar to it in hockey. It's kind of like not as bad as plus minus. Plus minus is a very outdated stat at this point. But I I look at it from the sense of the it's not enough to jettison a third overall pick. And like you said, I think that that quote was misconstrued and taken fully out of context a little bit by the people who tweeted that out. And it is something to be worked on. You can improve face-offs. You can bring someone in to improve on face-offs. It's not like a skill that is untrainable, which is why I'm not as worried that, well, he was bad at face-offs in Chicago. Well, he had one working wrist and was probably, you know, not, you know, focused on that among other things there. You can work with someone to get better at face-offs and you can have them work against, teammates and bring a specialist in which the canadians are doing it's not something i'm gonna sweat over right now it's not like he's you know 30 percent on face-offs or something terrible where he's losing two out of every three or whatever and on a night tonight it can shift we've seen nick suzuki go almost perfect in the dot and we've seen nick suzuki lose almost everything he's done and sometimes it matters sometimes it doesn't it's such a it's a hard thing to place in the grand scheme of things that happen in a hockey game is you like a missed assignment can lead to a goal and you can pinpoint where that went wrong. A, a face-off loss, unless the next shot goes directly in your own net is kind of hard to pin it on that because so many other things can happen in there. I like the biggest thing is I'm not going to sweat Kirby doc's face-off percentage in. We don't know what he's like after having an off season to heal up and hopefully not injure himself signing that new contract, which should be in the near future here. I, I just don't think it's worth sweating and getting upset over, to be quite honest. It's it's just face-offs, honestly. Right, and that's exactly the point that I wanted to make. Is not that they don't matter. It's just that they're not the be-all, end-all of a player's repertoire. And I think it's also really important just to note that, you know, if you're a good team, if you have one guy who's, like, poor at face-offs, you've got so many other guys who are good, you just put the person, the ideal person in, in, in that moment. Right. And whenever, whenever you're in whatever situation you need, offensive zone, neutral, whatever it is you like, if you're a good enough team with enough personnel, one guy being eh at faceoffs is not going to, you know, make or break the game. That's, that's what I meant. Uh, and we will be talking now about another thing that the Canadians uh, kind of need, which is uh, another defenseman. They're, kind of thin on defensemen right now and there aren't there that many options on the free agent market we're going to talk about all of that in just one moment but first our friends at built bar have a new promo code for you whereas before you'd enter locked 15 now you enter locked on 15 to get 15 percent uh 15 off your order at built.com and if you don't know what built bar is it is a protein bar that tastes just like a candy bar they're so delicious they've got so many good flavors i myself will have one uh when i need a pick me up sometimes i'm running late and i need you know energy for my day so i'll have it on the go have it as an on the go breakfast and they're all delicious so many delicious flavors to choose from so many delicious items to choose from really um and it's all about the energy they're all low in sugar and high in protein made with real chocolate delicious delicious flavors and if you haven't tried built bar yet now's your chance go to built.com and enter locked on 15 for 15 percent off your order that's built.com locked on 15 for 15 percent off your order 
And now on your first listen of the day, uh, we are going to turn our attention to a question mark that has not been answered yet in the off season, which is the Canadians don't have enough like NHL defensemen ready right now to play. And it's a weird situation they're in because in all likelihood, whoever they put on that roster on day one of the season is either going to be gone from the team by the time it's ready to contend or it's players that right now out of camp are fighting for spots in the NHL and somebody like, you know, somebody like Hayden Gooley, for example, maybe his first nine games or the first nine games of the NHL season, something like that. Like you've got a lot of young players who are probably not quite ready to play a full season there. And you've got, you've got some players who you think will be part of the future. And then you've got some players who you know won't be around and who even they themselves know they won't be around. You know, players like Chris Weidman and, and, and Joel Edmondson, they are honestly, like, I, I love their attitude. You know, they're, they know they're here to kind of help these young players develop and they're here to support the team. They're here to be part of the team. And they're really realistic about the fact that they're probably not going to be part of it, you know, two, three, four years from now when they start making the playoffs and start making noise. So, I think that they need more players like that. And honestly, on the free art, on the free agent market, it's PK Subban. And that seems to be pretty much it in terms of the options that they have. And I know PK Subban, I think emotionally is a bit different for people on this, on, uh, in this market because of, you know, how things were when he was here and how things ended with him here. So I don't even know if he'd want to sign back here. I don't know if he'd be welcomed back here and, we don't know even, you know, given his injury history and, and his back problems, like if he's even going to be able to be part of a, of, of a team that's on the way to improving. So I don't, I don't know, Scott, what would you do in this situation? I, I look at the Canadians defense right now and I'm on cap friendly behind me. And there are two players under the age of 25 in this defense group that are listed in the NHL group. And that's Jordan Harris and Justin Barron. Obviously, this is the lineup that mostly ended last year. Chris Weidman's 32, David Savard's 31, Joel Edmondson's 29, Mike Matheson is 28. And then in the AHL, Madison Bowie's 27, Corey Schooneman's 27, Otto Luskinen is 25. And then it's that core four of young guys, Caden Gooley, Matthias Norlinder, Gianni Fairbrother, and Arbor Jackeye. And it's a very interesting thing because the Rocket loaded up on AHL guys. So my question is, I'm wondering... Are they just going to have some of these younger guys fight for those spots? And if they're bad, it's a learning experience and they just kind of rotate through guys. But my thought is, it's like if they can get, you know, PK Subban on a free agent deal or something like that, why not take the chance? I look at here, Anton Strawman's out there, Danny DeKaiser, Calvin DeHaan's out there. Uh, it, it's very, very slim pickings, though, because I've already gone down a certain amount and there's not much Eric Brandstrom is out there, which is interesting to me. He's an RFA right now, I believe with Ottawa that would fit kind of what Kent Hughes and everyone is looking to do. And I wouldn't be surprised if, Hey, let's make a trade for Eric Brandstrom. He's got NHL experience. He plays a more up-tempo style and DJ Smith, quite frankly, doesn't seem to like him for whatever reason. And I'm sure Senators fans will let us know that I'm probably wrong, but I've seen how good Eric Brandstrom can be, especially in the AHL playing against the Rocket before. If they're not going to go after PK, I'm wondering if trading, because Ottawa's clearly going for it or moving forward this year, do they want a more veteran guy in their lineup and they want to shed you know, someone who maybe won't be playing all that much? And Eric Brandstrom might make a lot of sense, if not PK, on a one- or a two-year deal. We're not saying sign PK for like five years, like two, three years max if the money is right as someone just to help fill that lineup spot. And I think that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. You just got to make the money work because the Canadians right now are up against the cap and they still have Doc and Primo to sign. And obviously we know they're signing Kirby Doc. That's that's a non-starter. But I, I do think the other option out there besides Nils Lundqvist, which is something we forgot to talk about on Friday's episode is – potentially wanting out of New York, there are young options. You can look at a Lundquist or a Brandstrom, if not someone like Subban or a Kelvin DeHaan, just to kind of fill roster spots. Because like we said, the Canadians aren't supposed to be good. But a lot of goodwill could be had by bringing P.K. Subban into the fold, at least still 
It'll bring a little bit of life back to the Bell Center, I think. Even if they're not great, we know PK can be an exciting player still, assuming, like you said, his injuries and everything aren't too bad. I like the um, Lundqvist thing because, again, there's been very, very strong rumblings that the Canadians and the Rangers are talking. We're not, uh, we're not 100% sure who they're talking about just now. Uh, but the name that, pe- that keeps going around is Lundqvist. So I think that's definitely something to keep an eye on. And another thing to keep an eye on is Cole Caulfield, who, uh, you know, his next contract is coming up. Uh, and we're going to talk about what it could look like based on the many different scenarios. And all of that's coming up in just one moment here on Locked On Canadians. So I'm going to admit to shamelessly stealing, not stealing, no, I'm using I'm using her article as a springboard. Our friend Shana <laughs> Goldman of The Athletic and Sportsnet, uh, one of literally the best analytics writers out there today, had a piece for Sportsnet about the big question facing each Canadian team heading into the 2022-2023 season. And her question was, will Cole Caulfield be able to build on the second half of last season? So that was her big question. Uh, And I decided to kind of use that as a springboard and talk about what Cole Caulfield's next contract could look like if his development progresses as expected, if he has a really terrible season again, like the first half of last season, or if he builds on the second half of last season and has a brilliant season this year. And we're going to talk about all those scenarios. But first, Scott, I just want to point something out to you. Um, Because in this article, obviously, there's some, you know, some clear questions like for Edmonton, um, you know, uh, is, is, is Jack Campbell the answer between the pipes? Like Shana asks like a really prominent question and there are like legitimate questions, you know, like has Ottawa done enough to improve uh, in the off season for Calgary? Can, can Huberdeau and Kadri make up for the loss of uh, Johnny Gaudreau and, and Matthew Kachuk, right? These are all amazing questions, but then I like this question that she has for Vancouver and it is what direction do the Canucks take? Because for me, that kind of sums up the Canucks in a nutshell. It's like, what what are you right now? Like, who are you? What are you? And I thought that was really, I mean, it, 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 it's, it sums it up in a nutshell, but I also kind of thought it was funny. I feel like that's what we've been asking about the Canucks for like the last couple of years, that it's like, they're good or like almost kind of there, but not quite. And then like they went out and they gave JT Miller a absolute Brinks truck full of cash just to keep him around instead of trading him. And I look at it and I go, are we sure? Like, are we (laughs) sure? Like, and this, I, I think the Canucks are going to be much better. They have a nice core group of players. It's just, can you take that next step? Or are you going to have a bunch of good young guys on big deals and nothing to go forward on? They're not quite Toronto because Toronto makes the playoffs, unfortunately, but Vancouver's such a fascinating team because like they're right there and the Pacific is there for the taking Vegas is on the downswing. The sharks are bad. Sorry, JD. Love you, buddy. The Kings are on their way up a little bit. Edmonton's on their way up. Vancouver's or uh, Calgary's there. There's a space for them to take that. And I, I just don't know if they will or not. So to now from the detour, Uh, that we just took to Vancouver, which sounds beautiful. I mean, Vancouver sounds awesome place to visit. Caulfield's an interesting one because Tage Thompson got a new contract seven times 7.1 after of admittedly a great season in Buffalo, but his first really good one. And the question became if Kent Hughes were to call up Cole Caulfield right now and offer him seven by seven or eight by seven since it's max term, would we be okay with that? And my thought is right now, if Caulfield comes out of the gate red hot and you get him under seven and a half, I'd say yes. But my thought is right now, I'm, I'm wondering if they're waiting to see just how the season starts to make sure he doesn't have that same kind of slow start a little bit. I have no doubt they're trying to work towards a new deal. Like once they not announce docs, they may announce the next one right after that, hopefully. I, I do wonder if they could get Caulfield locked up like they did Max Pacioretty all those years ago. Longer term, keeps the cap hit down a little bit so they can continue to build around that. Can they sell Caulfield 
on, you know, he's not going to get paid more than Suzuki. And not unless Caulfield comes out and scores 40 goals the next couple seasons, he's going to get paid more than Nick Suzuki. But I do think there is something to be said about you pay heavy up front and wait for all those, you know, years to roll in. We know Caulfield can sc- has the talent to score 30 plus goals in the NHL. Dominique Ducharme is no longer his coach. So like, yeah, he's not going to shoot 30% like he did right under Martin St. Louis to start. But we know the talent is there, and it's important to keep that talent in the organization. Don't let him get offer sheeted. Lock him up now and stress way less about it going forward and continue to build your team around, you know, Nick Suzuki, Cole Caulfield, Caden Gooley, Yuras Lefkowski, and whomever else fits into that narrative right there. So I, I, it's just, can he do that? Can he take that next step? And based on what we saw at the end of last year, where he was playing under Martin St. Louis, I, I really do think he's going to have all that confidence in the world to make that kind of thing happen. Right. And the thing with Cole Caulfield initially was when he first made the team, even when he went to the Rocket, we were always like, don't panic, don't panic, don't panic if he doesn't come out of the gate swinging. But he did. He came out of the gate swinging, right? He had such a great initial you know first few weeks in the nhl he and uh, right after you know a stellar season in in the ncaa and all of that so for me i think that last year to me was an anomaly i you know and and i really do truly believe that cole caulfield is going to deserve uh more than tage thompson but if you can get him at eight by seven point something. And like, to me, that's going to look like a steal in a couple years, because the thing about him is that people worry about his size, but he's, he's so like wiry, like wily. He, he, he does not allow himself to be contained. If you look at the poor performance of last season, it was not him being contained. It was him shooting himself in the foot. Right. Right. He, it was, it was him not achieving. It wasn't because, you know, he was being defended well against or anything like that. Like I went back and looked at a lot of it and it was a lot that was in his head. And obviously the confidence is a big thing. He's still pretty young. I think he can build upon that. And like, I I truly don't have a big fear, you know, of him not being able, like of his size being a factor in, in, in how far he goes. So I really think that it is a matter of just will he do what it takes to achieve his maximum potential? He seems to care a lot about his own performance. He seems to take pride in doing well. And you can tell, you know, from from how, you know, success under Martin St. Louis begat more success, right? So I, I just, I find that it's hard for me to kind of gauge because if you're Cole Caulfield at this moment in time and you know that there's Slavkovsky, you know that there's another relatively high pick coming next season as well. You know, there's all these guys that the Canadians have drafted. Some of them have extremely high ceilings. Like, do you say yes to a contract like that? Or do you try to get more? And in my mind, I'm like, I, I, you know, I, I would try, but at the same time, if you want to be part of a contending team at this point, like if the vision is enough, like you, you take Nick Suzuki or less money, right? Yeah. And and that's the thing about it is it's like we saw Caulfield just trying so hard. Like he had moments and it's just, you know, it was bad luck and then bad confidence following it. The the vibes were less than immaculate and then it changed. And we know how quickly he can just go on a heater and score goals. And honestly, if they're betting on that, and I don't see why they wouldn't be, they brought in all these analytics staffs that can point out that he was shooting the puck a lot. You know, the luck just was there. If he's, at, uh, you know, open to this kind of deal, you take it right now because you're going to get the money saved on that. They have a good capologist. They have a good analytics department that they're building on. And they have a group that deals with younger guys or has in the past in that front office. And I think that besides getting Kirby Doc signed right now, getting Caulfield's extension worked out is probably their next biggest task here and then trimming the fat off this roster because Caulfield's not going to go out of the top six anytime soon unless – something miraculous happens. Otherwise, like Mike Hoffman becomes a 40 goal guy or Uras Lefkowski, you know, absolutely strapped a rocket to the moon. Caulfield's going to be that guy. I don't think he's going to be as red hot as when he was under Martin St. Louis. But if we're counting Caulfield as a guy who was on pace to probably score 35 goals in a regular season, if he had scored like he did under St. Louis when he kind of came off that heater, you pay good money for that. 
because that's a talent you can't buy in the NHL. Goal scoring is at a premium always. Goalies are better. Defenses are better. And you have this guy that you've drafted. He went straight from the NCAA to well, a short stop in the AHL to the NHL when they could fit him in under the cap. And he's proven he can stay at that level. You, you got to pay to keep that in the fold and not even open the opportunity to him going elsewhere. And if he if they if he says eight times six and a half is good, you you I run to his apartment and knock on his door, say hello to Oliver, <laughs> and have him sign that contract immediately. Like <laughs> I that'd be it'd be a steal for the Canadians to get him under seven million dollars. And if he takes off this year, you'd be lucky to you know keep that under seven and a half eight. We know he's not going to get more than Suzuki because he's not a center. But, you know, you want to be able to build around that and have some contract flexibility. I think so. Um, I'm just, every time we talk about cold coffee, I get so excited. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm like, can the season start already? We're exhausted. We're still exhausted. We haven't recovered from last season or the draft. Uh, but um, but we, we can't wait to talk about cold coffee all night in and night out. I really think that you know, 30 goals is, is a good target. 35 goals is not completely out of the realm of possibility. I think, you know, the Canadians are going to focus a lot on the offense this season based on who they've drafted and who, who they've put in that position. I think we're going to see uh, what they're going to try to do. And I think it's, it's quite smart of them to kind of deal with the goaltending and, and defense a little bit later so they can maximize the development of the offense but also maximize their chances of getting a high draft pick in 2023. Um, so all of this to say is that it's another week here at Locked On Canadians, and we will be back on Wednesday. Uh, we're still at three days a week until I believe the rookie tournament, in which in which we will go back to five days a week. We still have plenty of interviews with uh, other members of the Canadians community coming up. We've got a goalie week coming up. We've got the rookie tournament coming up. We've got tons of stuff coming up. So please subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcast. Subscribe to us on YouTube as well. Uh, or in, you know, in lieu of listening to us, uh, taking us around with you in your pocket every day. Uh, either one. And you can find us on Twitter at LO underscore Canadians. You can email us at LockedOnCanadians at gmail.com. Also leave comments in the YouTube, but be nice. Don't be a jerk. Otherwise I will delete you. Uh, and you can ask mailbag questions. I see there are mailbag questions for this week's mailbag episode already. Uh, so please keep them coming until Thursday night when we record the mailbag. And also don't forget to check it out if you've missed uh, Scott's Hot Ones Challenge. <laughs> and all of that is all on our YouTube channel. And thank you so much for listening. And when you're done listening with us, make your second listen of the day, Locked On NHL, where they're talking about all things to do with the offseason. There was a power rankings for jerseys. So check them all out. And we will talk to you on Wednesday.